A Connecticut man has been warning the public, get your money out of U.S. banks immediately. A historic financial reset in 2023 could cause a run on the banks unlike anything in our nation's history, he says. His warning has already reached 8.4 million Americans and 30 TV networks. And yet, few people realize this could actually happen on U.S. soil or what a sizable impact it could have on your wealth, especially if you have large amounts of cash in the bank right now. Normally, I might ignore all this, but it turns out he's a Wall Street legend whose work predicted the COVID crash, the 2022 crash, and the 20 best stocks of 2022 and more. Today, he's urging you to move your money into a new vehicle 50 years in the making. He's even posting a free recommendation, which you can access at Reset2023.com. His work pointed to a 10,000, 90% gain back in 2020, so don't miss this. A new vehicle, outside the banking system could massively boost your wealth. You can get the details today at Reset2023.com. Again, that's Reset2023.com. Hi, this is Daniela Camboni. Welcome back to the Daniela Camboni Show. Still here in Boston for the Stansberry Alliance Conference with our keynote speaker, Francis Haugen. Uh, Francis, you know, I know they love labeling you as the Facebook whistleblower, but you're so much more than that. But just to give context to the, to the folks book at the folks back at home, you basically, you know, working at Facebook, mm -hmm. once you left, you took tens of thousands of documents with you um, that revealed very frightening things about Facebook and social media in general and presented it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're involved with the SEC. Wall Street Journal broke the story and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for joining us here today. So much. Happy to be here. So much I'd love to talk about with you because one year later, mm -hmm. I'd love to know um, how life has has changed for you, really? Mm. Um, I would say like the, the, it's crazy, like if you look at a photo of me from, from like right before I left Facebook and, and today, or actually even right after I left Facebook and today, like I look like five years younger. Like I was so stressed um, when I was at Facebook because, you know, holding, holding a lie, uh, like keeping a secret uh, that endangers other people, it, it wears you down, right? Because you know that like if you did something, uh, and, you know, maybe, maybe you could save them. Like maybe you can make a difference. And um, you know, the last year has been amazing. Like I, I worked on civic issues on the internet. Like I know how hard it is for women journalists, for women politicians. Um, and I have had comparatively just an effortless whistleblow. Like I have opened DMs on like Twitter and, and Instagram and I don't get harassed. And you don't get harassed. I don't get harassed. I know it sounds, it sounds impossible. Right. So this is a huge, huge yeah. win here. Huge You're, win. Okay. Huge win. I know, like for for, for like right. the guys out there, you might be yeah. like, is that really such a big yes. thing? But but no, like we we've been facing a situation where of like for, for twenty years we've yeah. had more and more women politicians, and only in like the last two years has it gone down globally, and it's because um, women like very senior women are saying I get too many death threats, and I have never gotten a death threat. I've gotten like maybe one or two people in the entire time who were like you're a shill or like right. you're a crisis actor. Yeah. But beyond that, it's been, I sleep better at night. Well, that, like must, have been, so, you know, that must yeah. have been a concern for you. So like, mm -hmm. take us back, and, you, and I know you've recounted mm -hmm. your story you know, tens of thousands of times <laughs> by now. But you know, you entered all our living rooms. You became a household name. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew your face. I mean, and here you are. You're at Facebook. You mm -hmm. know, you, you have an incredible career. You're at one of the best places you know, to work at in the world that people would want this job. Mm -hmm. And you decided to leave, take the documents mm -hmm. with you. Tell me a little bit about what was going through your mm. mind, like where you found the courage to say, I'm gonna completely have an upheaval mm. of my life here. Well, I think there's two, there's two parts to that question. So the first is like, I, I never expected to come out. Like part of why the documents are right. so extensive <clears throat> was that I wanted them to be able to stand on their own. Like I, 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 I know it sounds crazy, like given how much media exposure I have, but like I've, I've had like two birthdays in 20 years. Like I eloped the first time I got married. I tried really hard to have a wedding the second time and we <laughs> still ended up eloping this summer. Um, uh, and like I never intended to come out. And um, my lawyers were like, hey, like Facebook know, is gonna know who you are the second right. the reporting happens. Like you are delusional if right. you think you can, like right. if you wanna take the risk right. of Facebook introducing right. you to the world. Um, but the secondary thing is like what made me actually act? And um, I, I, I have an MBA from Harvard, and I took a class on change management, which sounds like you know consultant buzzwords. Um, but you know, change management is a major field of study because it's really hard for organizations to change. 
Now think of how hard it is for an individual to change. When it comes to, to groups of people, there's, there's um, all these past decisions, this inertia. You really have to pick a vanguard. You have to say, this group of people is the future. We, the leaders, are going to endorse them. We're going to back them. We're going to protect them. And then we're, we're going that way. And Facebook did that for four years. So after the 2016 election, they said, we were massively asleep at the wheel. Yes. There was this giant Macedonian fake news network. Yes. There were all these other problems. Um, Russia was involved. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do the right thing. And they built up a 300-person organization. Mm -hmm. And right after the 2020 election, they dissolved it. And when they announced all of us, you know, we're integrating you into the other parts of the company, I knew that there was no chance that Facebook could save itself. And, and for context on the stakes, you know, in the United States, we think we have a, a Facebook problem or a social media problem. Right. We use the cleanest, most sanitized version of Facebook in the world. Like they invested, for example, for misinformation. In 2020, 87% of the operational budget for misinfo was spent on English, even, only, even though only 8 to 9% of users spoke English. They want people in the United States, the people who could regulate them, to not think the product is as dangerous as it is. So the, the focus was on let's try and clean up the appearance in the, in the, in the States. States, but the rest of the countries by the other countries by the yeah. wayside. And, and, in, and in 2021, so like between when I made that decision and when right. I came out, um, Ethiopia blew up. So, right. so there'd already been this giant mass casualty event in Myanmar, and then Ethiopia starts unfurling, you know, end of 2020, beginning of 2021. And, and this yeah. is probably a very big question, but why why do you think there is this lack of ethics? Hmm. I think it's this, you know, I think part of the problem is, you know, to get a job at a place like Google or a place mm. like Facebook, you have to take all of your electives and spend them taking CS classes. Mm -hmm. And CS curriculums are usually quite full to start with, so you don't have a lot of wiggle room anyhow. And so we're teaching young people to have, you know, godlike powers mm -hmm. and very little wisdom on how to use them. And so inside of Facebook, they set up an organizational structure that allowed people to um, kind of wash their hands of culpability. They said, you know, the things that matter are moving these metrics up. Right. We like all what? Agree Traffic? Things uh, like engagement, engagement? Users? Yeah. So, this thing so it's called, like hit these yeah. metrics at any cost? Like if these things go up, it's good. Okay. Right. And, 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 and it was meant to be liberating. You know, it was like, we can be a startup still if we just set good goalposts and then let people run however they want to get to those goalposts. And unfortunately, that same system devalues individual leadership or individual perspective. And so when people began to raise questions around, had changes they made in 2018 actually made the system way more dangerous, people didn't feel empowered to actually go in there and fix the system. It was a learned helplessness, I, I would say. I, I know in past interviews you've said that you don't think that Mark Zuckerberg set out to create this. Oh, I, I, unquestionably. You know, th those were not yeah. the intentions. Now it yeah. evolved into this. Um, but were you able to discuss directly with him? Or oh, no, no, no. The, it doesn't I, happen I, like that. that uh, Facebook, it's funny, for as flat as Facebook is, it is also in some ways very hierarchical. So, so uh, in, you know, Mark mostly deals with the people immediately around him, and maybe a couple levels down. Yeah. And part of why things like Myanmar happened was because right. there aren't channels inside the company for bad news to go up. You know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm mostly on Twitter. Um, yeah. I'm not a user of TikTok, mm -hmm. and I want to talk to you about that. Um, I am on Instagram and a little bit. And let's I, talk a I little. I tried editing a TikTok video for the first time oh. this morning. I was like, I wonder how people make TikTok. So videos. I'm not this, you know, social yeah. media yeah. guru by yeah. any standards, but. Um, when we look at the effects on young women of Instagram, yes. right? Um, I don't think much has changed. The yeah. pressures and yeah. what, what we're being fed constantly. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you see? Do you think there has been a change? Am I wrong in my analysis of that? So I think it's still yeah. extremely dangerous. So to give context to viewers, um, what the research shows is that there's a, there's a couple of particularly dangerous windows for, for, for kids. So when they go, are going through puberty, so this is like ages like 10 to 13, yes. literally uh, children's brains are changing. And because they're getting literally more oxytocin and dopamine receptors, you and I are never gonna get a compliment for the rest of our lives right. that feels as good as a 12 year old who's been told their genes are awesome, right? We're never gonna get that. But unfortunately in a social media context, that same incentives, it makes 
both the positive and the negative reinforcement much, much, much worse because they're just more vulnerable to it. I have not seen anything from Facebook where they're trying harder to keep under 13 year olds off their platforms, but they have put out parental controls for the first time. And um, for context, you know, they had 10 years to do any parental controls on Instagram and they launched them for the first time about three months after I came out. And so I think, you know, yeah. that meaningfully does make kids safer, but those fundamental issues, you know, the algorithm is still pushing kids towards extreme content. It's still introducing them to topics they're vulnerable to. Yeah, I mean, and that as, hasn't changed. as a mom of, you know, uh, How old are your kids? the twin boys, two yeah. years old. You know, ah, so, so you have some time. Far, I have yeah. time, but I'm already yeah. thinking about it. And Francis, I'm I'm scared. Of if, the, if one day you need a pep talk, yes, I, think I will I, totally do a pep talk for you. Yeah. You know, what would you, you know, I understand that a lot of the onus is on the parents, but yeah. I mean, it's hard to say you you can't have a I cell phone, yeah. you can't have social media yeah. when all your friends have it. So yeah. how is there, how can you protect, you know, the, the, the new yeah. generation? How is there something, anything we can do? So given that you're a mom of kids who have not yet entered elementary school, you actually have some time. So if you know where you want your kids to go to school, you know, you can get start getting involved now. And remember in um, Silicon Valley at some of the most prestigious high schools, these are ones where the executives for these companies send their kids. If you ask a 17 year old like, hey, do you use Instagram? They'll look at you and be like, we don't do that here, right? Like the, the, these are products that people who actually are right. in the know don't let their kids use. The reason they can do that, the reason why that 17 year old will scoff at you is because they went into the schools yeah. and they made it a cultural norm. Yes, yes. So, so there's a thing called wait for eight which is, you know, parents will come in at kindergarten and they'll do a whole ceremony around we're going to wait until eighth grade for cell phones. And because you do it as a community, community. you can say, no, 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 we already signed the form. Right. We said we're going right. to wait until eighth grade. Right. But I think the secondary thing is even for kids where they've started using social media, you know, we can go into school. Like one of the things I want to work on the next year is imagine if we went to schools and we pulled kids, like we have a rally or something, or we do some activities beforehand about the algorithm and the business model and and collective versus individual action. And we pulled the kids and said, how does it make you feel? Scale one to 10. How much do you wish you used it? How many hours a day? Okay, how much do you actually use it? And they showed the kids the numbers. And imagine if you let the kids vote on what should the rule be for the school. So if right now we're using three hours a day, what if the kids chose an hour a day? Right. Right now, individual kids can't choose to leave. Because if their friends don't choose to spend time in person, the kids don't get to make choices. And I think there's a big opportunity there of putting kids in the in the driver's seat yeah. and saying, guess what? Sometimes you guys have to work together. Those are very, very good insights. I want to ask you a little bit about the politics of it all. I mean, mm, we have the sure. midterms coming up. Yeah. Obviously, we'll have a huge presidential election around the corner. Uh, we saw what happened last time with mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, you've said you're you're not very uh, hopeful for the changes that have come from, yeah. from the company, so. And they've cut that election team. So yeah. with the election on the horizon, what, you know, what do you see unfolding the same? One of the things I'm particularly concerned about is, um, you know, we have such close elections that you can, one of the things I worked on was at Facebook was on something called narrow cast misinformation. So you have viral misinformation, and then you have targeted misinformation. And uh, you know, back during the 2020 election, there were teams that were actively watching for things like voter disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. You know, people coming in and saying, you know, uh, here's a bunch of rules you have to follow to vote that weren't true, or uh, the police are going to be at the polling station, so if you know, be careful. You know, like things that would intimidate people into not voting, and all those things are, are, are almost certainly gone. Like Facebook has reduced the size of that team by 80%. It's wow. like a publicly reported, uh, I think the New York Times did that. Um, and I can't imagine they're doing an appropriate level of care or concern. Uh, you're painting a very frightening uh, future, yeah. Francis. I, I just thoughts on TikTok because I've always been skeptical of it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sign up. I feel yeah. like they're going to just be spying on all yeah. of us. But I'm a little paranoid like that. Am I right to be? Like, would you I, avoid TikTok at all costs? I, I you know, um, there was actually a, a big article in the last like week or so where um, it came out that TikTok was using. Uh, the location data yeah. on the phones to track individual mm -hmm. employees, even past employees, and even people who weren't affiliated with the company. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, yeah. And and you can tell that they even knew there was something maybe a little off about it because they <laughs> had a team in China do it. They didn't even have an American team do it. Um, China is, or excuse me, TikTok is a Chinese company, right? It's designed to be to be controlled. 
right? So a difference between how Facebook works and TikTok works is TikTok makes no promises to you about what you see. Like the only promise they make to you is like, you'll want to watch another video. Um, and they intentionally channel, like the reason why things go like hyper viral yeah. on TikTok is they push the traffic towards a small number of items every day. So maybe a few thousand items will make up 80% of everything we view around the world. That's why we do funny dances and stuff. You can, it doesn't matter the language. Everyone speaks funny dance, right? Um, they do that so they can manually censor them. And there was a scandal maybe two or three years ago where if you were visibly gay or if you're visibly disabled, they took your content down uh, to protect you from being bullied. And so we have to be having conversations about how TikTok operates. Um, not just because we're letting a Chinese company influence what our kids get exposed right. to, what we get exposed to, because more and more people use it for their news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also an issue of if you don't do content moderation on TikTok, it's not a safe product because of that hyper virality, right? There's ways that we could roll back time on Facebook and make it safer. You can't make TikTok safe without doing that. And we're yeah. seeing huge consequences in places like Africa. So the Kenya election had yes. a bunch of violence this summer that was inflamed by TikTok. And I have talked to people inside the company and they had no moderators that spoke Swahili at the time of the violence. And that's one of the largest languages in of Africa. Course. Uh, just fascinating insights. I mean, uh, Francis, as we wrap here, I mean, what's what's next for you? Hmm. What's I mean, like I said, I, I, yeah. people just like labeling you as a Facebook whistle, yeah. but you're so much more. You're a data scientist. You're yeah. involved in you know in, mm -hmm. in pushing forward this agenda, so, so, and ch creating yeah. change. So what's next? Uh, so we founded a nonprofit called Beyond the Screen, which is based on the idea that that right now we've been limited by what we can see on our own screens, and if we want to have democratic conversations about how should these products exist in the world? We have to see beyond those screens. Um, and we're, uh, we just got funding from the McCourt Institute mm -hmm. um, for working around duty of care. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of investors, um, not just DSG investors, a lot of major pension funds, a lot of mutual funds are saying, hey, we've realized there were major liabilities on the books of Facebook. You know, the stock price is down at least 60% right now from, from its high, much more than other big tech companies. Um, we didn't understand what was going on. And we, we need help figuring out like what are the questions we should be asking to coach media, social media companies towards long-term success. Um, and so that duty of care work, um, I think is hopefully will be a scaffold for, for facilitating conversations like that. Wow, fascinating stuff. Um, are you still in contact with anyone from Facebook? From Facebook, from days, you know, it's days, funny. So you, you know how I said they dissolved our team? Yeah. Um, a lot of people quit the company after, after. they dissolved the team. Um, like when I left the company, my pod yeah. had, I don't know, maybe seven or eight product managers and program managers. And when I told my manager I was leaving, he was like, can you, can you wait a couple weeks for you <laughs> to say, say anything? And I was like, why? And he's like, well, some other people are leaving too. Turned out everyone in our pod left within a six week span. Wow. They either went to other parts of the company that weren't safety related anymore, or they just full left the company. Wow. So. So you're not getting phone no. calls from, well, I it's did, a new I chapter. Did, I did when I first came out, there, yep. were, there were people, but well, um, I think Facebook has, has told them if I ever talked to them. Of course, I would think your persona yeah. not yeah. grata there yeah. now, but I thank yeah. you for your courage. I thank you yeah. for being a keynote here. And my honestly, this, this talk is fascinating. Thank you yeah. so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for watching. We'll have much more for you, so be sure to stay tuned to the Daniela Camboni Show, and you can sign up at DanielaCamboni.com to stay on top of all these exclusive interviews. Thank you for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.